It's my pleasure to welcome um, the Minister for Innovation and Better Regulation, Matt Keane, who's given up part of his Sunday morning. Saturday morning. <laughs> Saturday morning. Um, to talk to us and really just to put us in the picture on um, what's happening on the regulatory front, uh, what we can expect uh, from regulation, and have we got any grounds for hoping that things get better. His portfolio includes strata law, consumer protection, workplace safety, so he's, he's like a sort of guardian angel portfolio, and I think as strata owners that's really what we want. We've got all these vulnerabilities, uh, and we do need protection. Minister? Sorry. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in. Um, and if you can have to put our minds at rest about all the vulnerabilities we have and the ones you know about in Strata, like you know, the defects, the unscrupulous contractors, and all these people who prey upon us. John, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for having me here today. And thank you for coming out on this uh, very delightfully wet Sydney morning. And it's about time, can I say. Look, it's a great pleasure to be here. And it wasn't that long ago that I addressed this body to talk about some of the challenges that you have and how we can work on dealing with them together. Now, the Owners Corporation, can I start by thanking the Owners Corporation, Phil, one of our directors here, and in particular, the uh, managing uh, director, Kara Stiles. Uh, I think you'll all agree she does an outstanding job representing the interests of those living in strata schemes right across New South Wales. So Karen, Phil and the entire team, thank you for the incredible voice that you provide for strata owners and thank you for the incredibly hard work that you do in working with government and making sure that the views of strata owners are heard across New South Wales. Now many of you know that strata is a growing uh, area of living in New South Wales. In fact, Units, or unit owners, represent about 20% of the population in New South Wales. So we've got about 519,000 strata and townhouse dwellings in this state, and that number's growing. It's in fact growing by about 10,000 every year. So it's becoming an increasingly important uh, part of our living arrangements in this state and indeed across the country. And I want you to know that government takes your voice seriously. We see this sector as critically important for providing the housing needs of New South Wales citizens and therefore we want to make sure that we understand your rights and protect them accordingly. So to that end, together we've worked on some big challenges recently. Take short-term holiday letting. Last time I spoke to you, we still had the options paper out and we were still trying to land the government's policy position. The challenge that I had, and we had together, was to balance the rights of investors to get a return on their investment, with also the rights of uh, owner-occupiers to the peaceful enjoyment of their own home. Now, we've tried to get the balance right by doing a number of things. So firstly, we've introduced the toughest laws in the country when it comes to short-term holiday letting. Now, what does that look like? Well, firstly, we want to make sure that residents can enjoy uh, the peace and quiet of their own home uh, by, and we'll do that by ruling out party houses in New South Wales. So under our two strikes and your out policy, if a building, if an owner or a property incurs two strikes in two years against the code of conduct, you'll be banned from all platforms for five years. That means that you won't have Bucks Night Central operating in the Strata scheme next to you every night of the week. That means you won't have party houses operating day in, day in, day, in, day out. We want to make sure that if you live in a strata scheme, you can enjoy the peace and quiet that you should deserve. So we'll stamp out those things under our tough two strikes policy. In addition to that, um, we're also making sure that uh, we heard your voice. You don't want your strata schemes turning into hotels. And that's why we're, giving, we're empowering owners' corporations to be able to ban short-term holiday letting for investment properties with a special resolution. 
So we'll empower owners' corporations with a 75% vote to be able to ban short-term holiday letting where the owner does not occupy the property. So if it's an investment property, the owner's corporation can stop short-term holiday letting by passing a special resolution. And that's important because we heard your voice that you were concerned that these, your, your strata schemes were going to turn into hotels. That's not something we wanted to see happen. So we've listened to that and we've added that into our legislation. In addition, we've capped the number of days that a strata scheme can host uh, a Airbnb style accommodation. So in Sydney, we've capped it at 180 days. If someone wishes to have uh, used their hotel or used their strata scheme for longer than 180 days, then they'll have to apply for a DA, just like any other short-term holiday letting uh, accommodation would have to in New South Wales. So these are some of the important reforms that we've introduced that have reflected the concerns that you've had and trying to get the balance right between the needs of investors to get a return on their investment, but also respecting the rights of property owners to the peaceful enjoyment of their own home. Now that's not the only area we've worked together on to get the policy settings right in this state. We've also done it when it comes to defects. And I know that there are some residents in this room here today that have been absolutely hammered by dodgy developers taking them for a ride by not providing adequate waterproofing, you know, uh, by, by building shoddy products. It's completely unacceptable excuse that me, you, you as property owners have yet. to wear the cost. Excuse me, well, excuse me I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. I'll be taking questions. I'll be taking question. question. No. I'll be taking questions uh, later. But let me just say, we've introduced tough reforms to crack down on dodgy developers with our 2% defect bonds. A 2% defect bond scheme provides a scheme where developers will have to set aside uh, money to be able to repair defects. And we've introduced a structured process whereby developers will have to resolve those issues with owners corporations in a timely manner. This is a huge reform. It's a game changer not only in New South Wales, but it is leading the nation when it comes to holding dodgy developers to account and making sure developers have to do the right thing by owners' corporations and the residents of strata schemes in New South Wales. Now, I understand that these reforms, having only come into play this year, don't capture a lot of the issues that occurred in the past. And I know some of our residents here, when they were brought into buildings, built in 2009 and before last year, they are still suffering from the impacts of these dodgy developers. But going forward, these reforms will go a long way to stamping out that process and making sure developers have to do the right thing. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So we've heard you when it comes to building defects. There still may be issues in the system. I understand that, John. And I, as the minister, want to get it right. So what we see, we're not, now 10 months into this new system, Let's see how it works and let's see what additional changes need to be made to protect those mums and dads that have bought properties that have been ripped off by shonky developers. As you know, I don't back away from a fight. I'm happy to stand up to dodgy Neither developers. Do I'm happy to stand up to people that want to take advantage of vulnerable people in this state. We've done it in other areas of my portfolio and we'll do it in this space as well. The final area that I wanted to address today is one that concerns many of you in this room, and that's the area of combustible cladding. All of you saw what happened at Grenfell, the shocking disaster that occurred there that took the lives of innocent people. Why did this happen? One of the key reasons it happened, because you had a situation where the fire safety systems were not in place in Grenfell. Now, can I give you some comfort? The fire safety standards in New South Wales are much higher than in other parts of the world, particularly over in the UK. Our buildings require you to have smoke alarms. They require you to have two exits. They require uh, that our buildings be designed to make sure that fire is confined to one space, that it can't get out of control, like it did in Grenfell, where the fire department didn't have the time to come and make sure that they got people out and kept them safe. Now, the New South Wales government, we've done a comprehensive audit of all buildings across this state. 
In fact, we've looked at 185,000 building projects and identified over 1,500 projects that we thought could potentially have cladding. Every one of those buildings that we've identified that may have cladding, the fire department in New South Wales has personally, physically inspected the buildings to make sure that we were certain whether or not the building required rectification or it didn't. Of those buildings that we have inspected, we've identified a small number, around 200, that need further work. And need further work. The councils and the New South Wales government are currently working on those buildings, but we've written to every owner's corporation, we've written to every owner, we've written to every occupier of a property which we think may have cladding to alert them to the risk. But let me tell you, we are taking our obligations seriously. We have the toughest fire stand safety standards in the country. We have now banned uh, some forms of cladding in New South Wales. We've physically inspected every building and the New South Wales Fire and Rescue has developed a safety plan for every building that we think could potentially have a risk. But there is more to come in this space. I don't want to see owners of strata schemes that have cladding on it uh, being left out in the cold. I want to make sure that you don't have to foot the bill for a situation where a building was certified that had cladding that should never have been used on a building. So we'll look at making, we'll, we'll look at making, uh, uh, responding to the issue of cladding and how we will pay for it. That is in the works at the moment. But right now we've identified the buildings, we've developed fire safety plans for each of those buildings, and we will look at other options when they come to light as to whether or not we will uh, provide a scheme to support property owners with affected cladding. So well, I've heard you loud and clear. We've responded in tangible ways around dangerous cladding, around uh, short-term holiday letting, and around building defects. I know we've got further to go, but I will commit this to you today. I will work hand in glove with the Owners Corporation Network to make sure that your voice is heard and that government responds accordingly. Thank you so much for having me here today, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Questions for the Minister. Um, the lady there with the dark hair was the first to the hand up. Hello. Hi, Minister. Um, Good morning. Oh, I'm very loud. I don't know. <laughs> the last time I spoke to you was in March and I cried. Um, you may remember me. I've been trying to get... Oh, I'm going to do it again. Sorry, everybody. I have been living in my home for three years. This morning I woke up in ankle deep water. I've been trying to get through to you. There are other people here who are desperate to get through to you. That's why you're getting a little bit of anger, and I'm sorry. No, no, no. Take a big deep breath, Aiden, okay? okay? Reel it in, honey. Okay, I'm trying to be as nice as I possibly can. I've tried to get through to you to get a meeting to you. I have sent you a video of my home. I'm in equal deep water today. I have an 85-year-old mother living with me. I have mould. I have five leaking rooms. I won at the tribunal. And I'm sure that there's some lovely committee members here who are doing their best for their owners, but I have a rogue committee. They have been in power for 20 years. I have spent $200,000 with my husband, who's a medical specialist. We're not rat bags. We're good people who we pay a lot of taxes. And we, no one is helping us. We don't know where to go if we don't go to you. I am begging you to listen to the people. We don't want to hear how wonderful everything is. We need help. And I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing is, I know you're a good guy and I know you're trying to do your best. But we need someone to make committees accountable. Yeah. We, we are not the people who should be policing the laws of the charter. We are not it's a great question. We'd love to hear the answer. Let's give the minister a chance to respond. <laughs> he knows my story. I know the story. Yes. And, and I tried to get him to speak to you and I got fogged off. So. Yeah, good on you. And I, I can't live like this anymore, minister. I'm living in a hostile building where people treat me like an outcast and I've done nothing to them except ask them to fix so, my legs. I know. And, and believe me, I understand what you've been through. We chatted last year about this. 
I wanted to start by saying, with regard to building defects, we've introduced a scheme that will deal with that issue going forward. I understand that that doesn't help everyone, particularly people in this room that have already purchased properties pre our scheme coming into play. But our scheme was introduced to help people like you to make sure that building defects would be addressed and they wouldn't be blocked by owners corporations or road committees and things like that. Yeah. Now, with regard to committees, and you're being stifled by your committee because the majority of people there, as I understand it, are investors and they don't want to pay additional levies and things like that. Yeah. You know, that is something that I'm absolutely committed to looking at. We've been, been dealing with a lot of complex policy issues in this space, whether it be defects, whether it be window locks, whether it be Airbnb. This is one thing that is on my agenda to look at. Now, I want to work with the Owners Corporation Network and I'd encourage you to keep engaged with Karen and Phil and the team here because we want a comprehensive policy position that deals with all strata schemes and will improve the lives of all strata residents. I understand your situation is unique but what's not unique is the it's issue of your own owners corporations and body corporates made up of people that aren't interested Investors, for example, not interested in the rights of owners and occupiers. We need to get that right, and it's something that I'm absolutely committed to do. So can I ask you to please continue to work with the Owners Corporation Network? We're developing our policy set that we'll take to the election to seek a mandate for. I want to make sure that we get something that will satisfy the rights or the needs of Stratoscan residents, and that's certainly one that's on my agenda. It's not just investors. We've got 57 owner occupiers and they don't want to spend the money either so it's not just the investors of the problem they are live-ins as well okay can, can we just uh, have a second question for the minister please uh, nick penny firstly uh, combustible cladding well done uh, secondly um, uh, i'm under the impression that while you can get um, rulings through ncat and ncat then has very little if any power to put severe, substantial penalties on owners corporations that don't comply, yeah. and I'd ask you to comment on that. Well, but firstly, Mr. Petty, um, you don't need to apologise. Please, Minister. You don't need to apologise. Um, uh, this is my job, and I understand people uh, have uh, a lot of emotion when it comes to the cost that they're incurring. I understand that I am a Minister of the Crown. My job is to make sure that we're getting the policy settings right that protect everyone in this state, including people that have been taken for a ride by shonky developers. Well, um, with regard to the tribunal and fair trading in particular, one of my frustrations as the Minister is that fair trading doesn't actually have the powers to be able to direct uh, an outcome. So often you have to go off to the tribunal and then they don't have the powers to direct an outcome. Now, we've made a number of changes since I've become the Minister, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, small claims. So I've now given fair trading the power to resolve disputes and have their decision binding. And the effect of that is the tribunal is still relevant, but if you want to challenge the fair trading outcome, uh, well, the aim of my reforms has been to make sure that you as Joe Citizen don't have to spend your time and money taking on a big business in the tribunal to recognise or to realise your rights. I want to see that rolled out to other areas, not just small goods and small claims, but I think it would work effectively in the area of strata. So that's something that we're doing some work on at the moment, which will give fair trading the ability to make a decision which will be binding on the developer and the owners corporation. If the owners corporation, uh, if the developer wants to challenge the decision of fair trading, then they have to spend their time and their money, not taking on the owners corporation, but taking on a fair trading. I think that's only fair. Okay. Uh, next bit is, you mentioned this year regarding the planning. Uh, I understand that the, the planning has, that the, uh, that the Act has been passed, but my understanding also is that there are two issues outstanding, namely the planning content of it and the code content of it, right. and that until... And then, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. short term holiday. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can just let the minister <coughs> respond to those two points? I have finished. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, as I understand it, Minister, um, those are pending and therefore it can't be proclaimed until they are included. Uh, would you clarify that point, please? Because I believe there's a great deal of misunderstanding in the strata community on it. Yeah. And give me an idea of your ETA for the Act being proclaimed. 
So the first thing is with regard to our two strikes and your out policy, uh, that relies on having the code of conduct uh, implemented and proclaimed. So uh, we'll do that via regulation, but what we've done is set up a committee, a steering committee, which the Owners Corporation Network is participating in, uh, to develop the code of conduct. I want to see the code of conduct have things like uh, limits to noise, uh, the hours that you can, uh, certainly noise around hours, so you know, after 10 o'clock, we don't want us to be seeing wild parties and music playing, things like that. Um, there'll be a whole range of things addressed in the code of conduct. If you then breach that code of conduct on two occasions within two years, we will have all platform, we will have the property and the occupier, uh, so the owner and the occupier, banned from all platforms for five years. So that's not my question, Minister. Okay. That's not my question, Minister. It was. When will it? Yes, I'll get. To I was just explaining, so with regard to our code of conduct, so that's been developed at the moment. I hope to have that done by the end of the year. When that comes into force, then it will be, we'll do a trial for 12 months to see if it's working from the time that the code of conduct is proclaimed. So I hope to have that done before the end of the year. It's quite complex because there's obviously lots of vested interests. You've got owners, you've got occupiers, you've got the platforms, you've got uh, residence committees on there. And so trying to land this thing is not easy, but I'm confident that we'll get it in place by the end of the year. Um, that said, there's a lot of work to do. Once it's in place, then we'll be trialling our system for the next 12 months. The Code of Conduct does not rely on the, uh, the SEP, which is with Minister Roberts, which will regulate the number of days. That's a separate issue altogether. My focus, so I regulate the Strata Schemes Management Act and the Fair Trading Act, which brings into force the Code of Conduct and regulates uh, the two strikes you're out policy. So that is separate to what Minister Roberts is doing with regard to the caps of how many days you can rent out property. So is the bill in force yet? Has it been proclaimed? Uh, the bill has gone through the parliament, oh, no. but the regulation, yeah. uh, which gives effect to our two strikes policy and the code of conduct, is not in place yet. And I'm hoping that that will be in place by the end of the year. Thank you. Uh, Minister, how are you fixed for time? I'm, I'm OK. You're OK? I'm OK. You're I, have, fine. I have another engagement at 10 o'clock. At but 10 o'clock? Uh, they'll understand if I'm late. <laughs> we, have a program, John, to work we, we were working to... I've got to earn my keep today, John. I know, we, we thought we were only going to be blessed with half an hour of time. <laughs> uh, let's split the difference and let's have one more question and then we'll revert back. But thank you very much for being... I'm uh, happy to take any questions that you like, but... What, yes, please. Uh, one question from the gentleman at the back on the end of the row. Um, Minister, it's quite interesting to hear you uh, sort of fight for consumers to uh, relieve them from the effort involved in uh, resolving disputes. I think, uh, you know, becoming an owner only recently in the last couple of years and in Stroud pretty much taking up every aspect of my life. Um, <laughs> the problem I've experienced is that to understand Strata legislation, uh, from my perspective, is, is literally impossible for the normal consumer. So, um, in your mind, are you generally thinking uh, that the direction is to uh, further relieve consumers? And, and if so, like, what, what tactics are you thinking of employing? Or are you uh, wanting consumers to become more uh, knowledgeable about the law and to handle uh, relief industry, which, as I understand, is, is not particularly big or, or in my opinion, functioning okay. very well. Um, are we, we clear on that question, or does it need interpreting? No, I think, I think um, uh, to your point, I want to see the little guy get a fair go in this state. Uh, whether it be around consumer law, whether it be around strata law. And you shouldn't need a barrage of lawyers to be able to enforce your rights. In this business where, you know, small operators... If you a barrage of lawyers, do you have to understand the law yourself? But that's why fair trading should be stepping up to the plate and assisting you in standing up against uh, shonky developers or dodgy real estate agents or people that want to, you know, take advantage of you, like is, is it a companies like, like VGoGo. Like a, a and that's for the consumer. 
Is that is that, is that is that how you think of it? Is it a bit like like a, a legal aid, but like specialized for the verticals of consumer and strata? Well, no. What, what I'm saying is, we want to level the playing field and give a fairer go to mum and dad investors across New South Wales, and make sure that you don't need. Uh, a barrage of lawyers to enforce your rights. And that's where fair trading can come in and assist. Uh, right now, fair trading doesn't have some of the powers that you're looking for to be able to protect you as consumers in this state. And I know it's a great frustration. It's a frustration when you come to me and you say, we want you to do something. Well, I say that the laws that I have available to be do something are not giving me the things that I need to be able to help you in some sense. We have tried to identify every building in New South Wales which we think may have cladding. Now, it's important to remember that not all cladding is dangerous. Some cladding, depending on what type of cladding it is and how it's configured, is perfectly fine. That's the first point. There are plenty of materials that propagate. What we're doing is uh, undertaking the appropriate work to identify on a scientific basis which cladding is dangerous and could pose a risk to property owners in New South Wales. We're doing that pro work at the moment. We've identified over 200 buildings. We're working our way through every one of those buildings. And for each of those buildings we've identified, the Fire and Rescue New South Wales has tailored an individual fire safety plan for that building. What does that look like? Well, that means if they get a call that there's a fire in a building that we've identified, that's logged in their system, and that incurs a response. In some cases, up to 18 fire units, they have developed a strategic plan for every single building we've identified. And One of the frustrations that I have is that this stuff has been put on buildings in the first place. Cladding, a Luca Bond cladding, which is the flammable stuff, is the equivalent of putting petrol on the building. And it should never have ever been used in any way on any buildings in this country, but it has been. And one of the reasons it has been is because you've got a system in New South Wales where the certifier signs off on a developer's project because there's no independence and there's no incentive for them not to do so. So right now, just remember, when Labor privatised the certification process in 2008, they didn't put any governance in place which has allowed certifiers to be chosen by the developer and then be paid by the developer. And people are genuinely concerned about certifiers in New South Wales that have been signing off on developments across this state. You people, many of you have bought into projects which have been signed off inappropriately. Inappropriately, and it's disgraceful. And that's why last week I came out, I've got an options paper on the table, and I'm asking the Owners Corporation Network and the people in this room, if you are worried about certifiers in this state and the governance around developers, then I want you to respond. And I want your voice to be heard. Because right now, I think it's crook that the developer can choose their certifier, and then they pay their certifier. So the certifier relies solely on the developer for their meal ticket. Now I want to see that shaken up. And that's why I'm proposing a cab rank style system where the developer can no longer choose their certifier. And there's genuine independence between the, the people who sign off on projects and the people who build them. I think that's entirely appropriate. But you've got a system, you've got a system which allowed flammable cladding to go up on buildings. It was signed off, so the developer put it up. The, the authority to the consent authority to sign off on it as to whether it was appropriate did so, and it put lives at risk. And it is absolutely crook. And I'm the poor bloke yeah. with you guys trying to clean it up at the moment. The time has come to hand the microphone over to OCN, who are going to say many, many thanks to you. I, I'm happy to keep taking questions, but <laughs> I think we need to go back to that program out of fairness to the people who uh, are put it together, which is Sedgwick. Um, personally, on behalf of ACN Minister, I, I, I thank you very much for, for coming along and, and, and taking, I, I like what you say, that's your job, to hear what people have got to say, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm in the same boat. I'm from ACN, and I've heard what people have had to say, and uh, I had all these things I was going to say about about OCN and uh, what, you know, how we're going to help owners, and I, it's all, I've torn it all up because frankly, I've, I'm back like you, we've got much bigger problems than we thought we had, and um, and an organisation that at least can work with you to address some of those problems. Uh, on behalf of ACN, I'd like very much to thank you for your time. Before I do that, 
Uh, I'd very much like to acknowledge the, the people that keep OCN going. Um, OCN can't survive without, without funding. Um, and our funding comes from, from long-term sponsors, um, which um, Longitude Insurance in particular and BAC, uh, who, who have been helping our organisation. Um, that doesn't mean we, we, we endorse them as the greatest insurers and brokers around the place, but it does mean that we have a comfort with them as a competent company, and otherwise we wouldn't be working with them. Um, but we have to acknowledge them because without them, OCN couldn't function at all. We wouldn't be able to have a staff office. Um, I'd also like to um, thank very much Sedgwick and Sergon uh, for basically putting this function on today. Uh, the purpose of the function primarily was to, we recognised that people were facing uh, very difficult times with, with, with buildings and major projects and um, uh, obviously there's a lot of issues still to resolve in terms of funding these projects but um, we've got to somehow deal with the defects issues going forward, we've got to work out how we're going to deal with those and Sedgwick are going to help us um, through that today with their expertise. And also, um, as a strata owner myself, having been through defects programs, major projects in my old building and my new building, I understand how hard it is. Uh, and, and the challenge is getting the right expertise, putting projects together, getting them through committee and so on. And that's, that's a big part of, of what we're on, to, on today. Um, most importantly, I, I just want to emphasise what makes OCN different from any other organisation. And that is that it is the only organisation I know of that is run by owners, for owners. There are plenty of strata services around. Um, you can go on the internet and find them. They're commercial services. Um, there are organisations that um, are basically run by strata managers and, and other service providers. The distinctive difference between that and OCN is that we are members being run for, by members. Now we talked about short term letting a little while ago. We have a voluntary, honorary member of OCN who is a qualified lawyer working on the code of conduct and I, I, you will not believe the amount of work that she is putting on, putting in on that code of conduct committee, uh, trying to make sure that the strata part of that is properly recognised in that code of conduct for short term letting. Um, without people like her, uh, she's an owner, like me, like you, who has issues with short-term letting in her building and she's taken between the bit, not complaining about it, but getting on and applying her talents and skills to, to helping us out. We, we simply couldn't afford what she's putting in if we had to pay for it. We have a bunch of buildings who have put some money into the pot. Um, similarly with cladding, uh, we put a call out to all the members who've got cladding issues uh, to come together because we believe that working together, owners working with owners, uh, we can do more collectively than we can singularly. That's the direction and the significance of OCN, it's what makes us different. Um, and, and, and I think uh, I was going to talk a little bit about a lot of other things, but I, I think today I just want to take away uh, this is the second time I've come to a session where the anger and frustration has, has boiled over in a year. Uh, it just emphasises to me how badly we need to, to, to have an organisation like ours that can actually get access uh, and, 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 and put the minister in front of people, real people, with real problems so that he can actually understand it. Um, so I want to thank all the, all the members that have come today to, to make, to having made that point very clear. Uh, certainly to the Minister and also to me, because it's reminded me of the issues that are out there. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Um, very briefly, I'd like to hand over to the fantastic Karen Stiles, who's just going to do a quick summary of the things that we have achieved, and I know there's a lot more that needs to be achieved, but just a quick summary of the things that we have achieved since our, since our uh, instigation. We are an organisation which, in my view, punches above its weight, um, and I'm hoping it will increase our weight and punch harder in the future. Karen. Thank you, Phil. Another voluntary person of many. Um, OCN was established in 2002. It was entirely voluntary until 2012. It currently has a part-time person. Um, probably OCN's most important achievement has been to raise the profile of Strata 
when I came on board, government was strata blind. They had no idea there was either individuals, small businesses. We didn't exist. They didn't notice us. Since then, there's been an explosion of reforms around strata as governments have, have realised the importance of the sector and the enormous growth of the sector and the voting power of the sector. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, strengthen property protections for strata owners. OCN caused the New South Wales Government to convene the Joint Select Committee on the Quality of Buildings in 2002. We're still working on it. We've got a long way to go, but I think um, with the Minister having a fairly clear idea on how the system is failing us, um, we might be able to speed that up. So it is good that he sees real people. Um, we triggered uh, a register of homeowner warranty certificates because builders were um, uh, fraudulently, they were you know, photocopying like we do with driver's licences to get a drink. Um, prom we prompted legislative obligation for developers to build as built plans and drawings to the owners corporation. Previously they had nothing. Um, we're working still on reforms to off the plan pro uh, contracts. The first one stopped sunset clause rorts in their tracks within two months, which was spectacular. There's more to come very shortly before Christmas. Uh, and we gained access for buildings over $50 million to the terrorism pool. Until then, they could be uh, standing next to a commercial building and have no protection whatsoever. It was a ridiculous situation, but it took us four years to get it, and now we're firmly in there. The second thing I want to talk is about is strata law reforms. OCN made an enormous contribution to the reforms that started in 2012 and took about four years. John was very involved in that at the time. Uh, I think we ate, slept and, and dreamt about it. Um, we provoked the ban on developers acting as a strata manager for the first 10 years. Previously, one in particular had had a habit of sending, putting his strata company in there and therefore nobody could see any defects. Amazing how that worked. We caused the requirement for a 10 year sinking fund plans, now called capital works plans. Um, and then in 2015, we um, got the government to link those plans to the annual budget. Uh, budget. We got a cap on strata management contracts of one year at, from the first AGM and three years thereafter before that they could be any length of time and there were no KPIs. We strengthened the disclosure around insurance commissions uh, and we required strata managers to provide three quotes and we're working to strengthen that again now. And we caused minor renovations to be suitably defined and not necessary for an AGM to be held. Um, Phil's already touched on short-term letting. Um, we got a spectacular last-minute reprieve after a lot of hard work, um, preventing investors from short-term letting. That was never going to happen without OCN's intervention. Um, and we are on the advisory committee. Not only do we have Jane, who's uh, an accomplished government lawyer, but we also have a planning lawyer and a QC working for us pro bono because they think this is so important and they believe that OCN is the body that can deliver results for owners. So in closing, I want to acknowledge the members helping members. There's an amazing amount of work that goes into everything we do, whether it's the, the members forum or the website, these events, um, all the advocacy that we do on your behalf. Um, there's some amazing people. Phil is one of them. We wouldn't be here without the, the voluntary contribution. So if you have a skill and you're hankering for a better strata world, please get in touch with me. You know where I am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. For those of you who only casually get involved with OCN, Karen and Phil are the driving forces, not just through their foresight and intelligence and knowledge about strata, but because they give a large slice of their own life over to strata. And I think we, we have to thank them for not only where we are today, but the road we've come along to make OCN what it is, bearing in mind we've got to go forward. And we were going to talk to you about how we go forward. Um, there's not time to do it today, but we will do it at a, a later stage. There's some pretty exciting ideas up there for what OCN will be. In the meantime, can you just put your hands together to applaud the work of 
Karen, Phil and the like. We now move on to the heart of this meeting, which is what we're all here for. We've come to hear from Sedgwick consultants, particularly from Bruce McKenzie, who has put a lot of work into what he's going to say today. He's also making his talk very apt. He's going to talk about defects. We've already started the dialogue today about defects, and Bruce is going to continue it in the vein of what he and his colleagues can do to help you. He's also, I'm sure, going to talk about cladding because we've got the guy here who's been deeply involved in cladding for the last couple of years. Bruce, um, I welcome you to OCN. I'm thrilled that your bio includes you having had a spell as a licensed building manager because the sort of consultants we trust are those that have got their hands dirty and not those who got a degree in consultancy. Bruce McKenzie. Hello everyone. Um, I'll just start, I was a, I'll give you my background first just so there's a bit of perspective. Um, 30 years plus I've been in the building industry as a licensed builder initially and I moved into my role with Sedgwick um, and we've just transitioned from a, a business called Sergon Building Consultants into what's known as Sedgwick now which is a global uh, risk management business. It's actually the biggest in the world at the moment. Um, we've got a huge um, workforce uh, worldwide and our role is to deal with um, building issues, defects, insurance claims. We're not builders, despite the fact that's my background. We're not builders, we don't build, we don't regulate, so we're not in charge of any kind of um, uh, regulation. Um, we are here to assist, that's our role. Um, before I start, I guess um, what I'm recognising, a lot of passion in the room, a lot of people are upset here. Um, please understand, we see this every day. Um, we deal with owners' corporations, we deal with owners, um, property loss, catastrophe, all sorts of things. We do see it all the time. We understand um, your concern. Unfortunately for us, sometimes we can't change what's happened, we can't change legislation, but we can certainly put in place things to hopefully um, make you move forward and, and create a better situation for you. So. Um, so that's our, um, that's our background for the business. Um, my, uh, my role um, extends back to the La Crosse fire in 2014. Um, our business was involved in that um, when the fire occurred. And I've been invested uh, a lot of time and effort in cladding since that time. I'm not going to feature that in my discussion today, although I could talk forever on that because I've um, lived and breathed it for so long. Um, but what I will just add is um, I would caution everyone to, to um, watch what you read in the media, watch all the statements. There's a lot of misinformation about products and different things out there. Um, my involvement has been to go to a full-scale fire test, to meet with suppliers, to, to uh, understand the problem fully, and I do have a lot of knowledge on that. Happy to talk about that later, but certainly just be cautious about what you hear, because I hear a lot of misinformation every day, and it does mislead people and, and put people in a, um, a spot of unrest when sometimes they don't need to be. So what I'm going to try and talk about today, I'll cover off on, on defects. Um, I'm sure everybody in this room has seen and dealt with defects that is so common. Um, so I'm just going to run through some common defects that um, we all um, probably have dealt with before. Um, managing repairs and upgrade projects, so I'll talk about that a bit later after the break. Um, the Strata Bond Scheme Overview, I won't go into that, I'll just have a one page slide and just quickly update for anybody who's not familiar with some of the, the detail on that, and I'm happy to take questions as well. So, but I will try and just keep it running um, along the way if we can, and I'm happy to take questions at the end. So what is a construction defect? Um, these are some, um, some definitions that I've found, and I'm, I've been trying to search for material that really does describe it. <coughs> An imperfection that impairs the worth of the utility. A lack of something necessary for completeness, adequacy or perfection. Um, I think um, my partner's actually said that to me before, so it's um, <laughs> something that's relevant. <laughs> um, we've probably all heard it. But um, example of a defect there, a, a quite a, a dramatic one, of course, but um, a window not installed correctly. And you can see on the, on the photograph at the bottom there, 
We've got penetrations in buildings that are not sealed properly. These create water ingress. These are just some common um, defects that most of us have seen before. Um, some other definitions just out of the, um, the dictionary. Um, we can go on with plenty of um, comments there. False flaws, imperfections, deficiencies, etc. Um, what's not a construction defect? This is relevant and I think everybody needs to take note because um, quite often um, there's items that people do think it's a defective item against a builder and in fact it's not. Um, what I'll, I'll say and I'll reinforce again, my background is building. I was a builder for a number of years. Um, what I do now is criticise builders and I, um, we write scopes of work to repair damage. I'll assure you not all builders out there are unscrupulous and, and same with developers. There are good ones. Don't lose faith. There are. We see them. But certainly there are a lot that shouldn't be trading and, and that's unfortunately what we deal with the most. Um, damage from occupants or other parties other than the builder or the contractor, so certainly um, any damage you cause yourself. Reasonable wear and tear, lack of maintenance, that's an example there. If you're maintaining a roof, you end up with a roof leak. Uh, quite often that might be pointed towards a defect when in fact it's not. Some more uh, simple things like damage to property and heading back to reasonable wear and tear. Um, the investment you need to make in your properties is a give-take situation. Um, it's like anything, you've got to get your car serviced to get that, that length out of your car, the, the lifespan out of your car, and you need to do the same with buildings. You have to invest in maintenance of those buildings, and I know for you guys that might be hard. Quite often you've got to get consensus from everybody to spend $15,000 to paint the building, which not everybody agrees on, but it is, it is something that will um, prolong um, the life of, of your building by maintaining it. Um, material use and substitutions, I'll cover off on this quickly. There's two definitions here. Um, non-complying. What non-complying is, is something that complies with the minimum design standard, however is used incorrectly. Now, that building there is, is um, Grenfell Tower over in the UK. Doesn't look like that anymore. The product that went on there is a polyethylene core cladding. Um, that product it's actually not banned and it, can, it has been used for many years in signage and in other industries. The problem that happened with the cladding is it extended into buildings on low-rise buildings, it extended up into high-rise buildings, and now we have the problem we've got today where it was used everywhere. So it's something that was not intended for high-rise buildings. It's illegal to use it on high-rise buildings. But I'll clarify, it's not illegal to use the product full stop. It can be used but it shouldn't be used in, in these sorts of situations. There's legislation in place in New South Wales and all the states in Australia for that, um, but that's, that's the point I'm making. The product itself wasn't illegal, it was used in the wrong way. Non-conforming, on the other hand, um, it doesn't meet minimum design standards. So what non-conforming, uh, best way to explain it, is, is you're going to Bali and you're buying your watch that's a Rolex, and in fact it's not, it's fake. Um, Non-conforming non is, is products out on the market that don't meet the standards that we have in Australia here. Unfortunately, we have a lot. Um, they make their way into Australia. So a few examples down the bottom there, we've got steel. Steel was a, probably an issue more 10 years ago, but we were getting a lot of steel out of places like China that was inferior didn't meet the standards we had here, but it got used. Um, we talk a lot about cladding at the moment, but trust me, there's a lot of other products that are probably equally as, um, as misused, um, but perhaps not as um, widely publicised as what cladding is. Um, glass, another product, electrical cable, they're just some examples of non-conforming um, non products that have made it into Australia. <laughs> the most common defects in strata, so, um, Waterproofing, it stops there. Waterproofing is the biggest number one problem. I'm sure everyone in this room has dealt with some sort of waterproofing issue. Um, and that's from external, so we've got balconies, roof areas, windows, uh, and of course interior, bathrooms and showers. Um, interesting statistic for you, waterproofing and prevention of water ingress accounts for 1.8% of total construction costs. What I mean by that is the cost of the membrane that goes in your shower or your, your balcony, it could be your flashings around your windows, just all the little devices that stop that water from coming into your building. Um, waterproofing and water ingress, however, accounts for 83% of building defect complaints. So it's, it's a very, very real problem. We see it every day in what we do. Um, it's something, you know, we, we try and work through but the problems which I'll get onto further um, stem all the way back into waterproofing and this little insignificant cost at the beginning of the construction that wasn't spent right or wasn't done properly. 
So the most common defects, um, material substitutions I spoke about before. So this is using um, materials that are not the same quality as specified. That's an example of a particle board floor. It should have been a compressed fibro floor or something that would withstand moisture. That, that would, was put in um, intentionally, but should not have been put there in the first place. Um, shortcuts and construction processes, flashing missing. Window door junctions, so these are common problems as well where builders, uh, developers don't follow a process that might comply with the Australian standards. You can see all these gaps there. You don't need to be a builder to know that that's going to leak and you're going to have a problem. Incorrect step downs and hobs, this is a very, very common one as well. There is a requirement, an Australian standard requirement, that there is a step, or, or sorry, a building code of Australia requirement, which is now referred to as the National Construction Code. Um, between your internal floor area and your external, you should have a step down of 75 millimetres. Um, these are, most of these photos I'm showing you too, by the way, are live photos, things that we've collected on projects we've worked on. Um, this is North Queensland, and we see it a lot up there, where there's no difference in the floor height externally and internally. Again, you don't need to be a genius to work out when you get a bit of water and a bit of flooding and ponding, it's going to make its way inside. You can see here another example, we've got a measurement there. The diagram down the bottom just shows you what the requirement is, um, and that is that difference in height and, and obviously a fall away on the outside of the building so water can get away. Membrane failures, uh, this is just another balcony um, with a membrane that's failed. Very, very common problem. Again, we see it uh, regularly. And down the bottom there, what that is, is, is a solution to, um, and I'll talk about solutions a little bit later, but balcony step downs, as I mentioned, when people don't have the step down, we have problems. And what we've all seen with, with modern construction these days is the desire for fluency inside and out. Everybody wants to, their living room to flow out onto the balcony and they want it to be seamless. They don't want to hold, they don't want step downs. They want to be able to, you know, wheel things in and out. And, and that can still be achieved. This is an example of cutting a grated drain retrofit into a building. Putting that great grated drain in place does give you the, the uh, deem to satisfy on the, on the National Construction Code. So it is a solution. But I will highlight it's not a solution body on the basis if you can't cut into a concrete slab for a structural reason, then you can't use that as a solution. Um, we've been involved in cases where we've had to actually rip the aluminium doors out, build a hob, reconstruct the windows, put them back in again to get that hob to get compliance. Corrosion, where unsuitable materials are used. This is just an example of, of screws being used that were incompatible with the roof sheeting. Um, again, we do a lot of work up in North Queensland in the cyclone belt areas and areas that are subject to salt water and corrosion. We have that around Sydney here as well. Uh, it's crucial the materials selected are correct and there is a requirement of zones from the ocean back uh, certain distances in terms of what materials you use. It's crucial that you do stick to that. Manufacturers will walk away in an instant if you don't follow their requirements. In other words, use a screw that's recommended um, for that distance from the ocean. Combustible cladding, um, I won't talk a lot about this, although I could. Um, I am involved at the moment in the litigation case um, down in Melbourne, which I'm hoping is almost closed out at the moment. Um, this is a picture of the lacrosse building. Um, a bit hard to tell, but there's a dark section just to the right of the crane there where the fire occurred. The fire was just a, a column in what's called um, the O5s, which are unit five from the ground floor to the top floor. It burnt vertically. Uh, it didn't spread horizontally. I will point out, and I know everybody's sort of interested in the topic and I won't go on about it, this particular fire when it occurred was surprisingly minimal damage. The cladding burnt, sure, but internally um, the, the plasterboard, the kitchens, the other things that were subject to, to exposure to fire were very, very quickly extinguished by a sprinkler system that was installed in the building beyond the code so that the system was beyond what was the requirement. Um, in Australia here we have a, an evacuation um, procedure where we evacuate the building straight away when there's a fire. The alarms went off, people evacuated out of the building, um, there were no loss of life. It was a good result in that respect, bad result for the building, still hasn't been repaired properly. Um, when we talk about, and, and there's a photograph there of the actual um, aluminium cladding and where, where the fire propagated from. Um, Grenfell, on the other hand, it, an entirely different situation. The cladding was attached to the outside of the building, it wasn't part of the external wall. Um, the building, in fact, Grenfell Tower was quite okay the way it was, solid masonry structure, solid um, concrete, 
Um, it was done for aesthetic purposes to, to make a building look better, a little bit of thermal quality. Um, essentially what happened in, in that building, um, there was a myriad of problems from fire escape to, to smoke to, to different things. Um, but the worst probably factor of that fire was the stay put policy. So they didn't evacuate, they all stayed put and we ended up with 72 fatalities. So very different result, they had no sprinklers, their, their escape system was inadequate, fire doors were not closing, smoke engulfed the stairwell, people um, perished in the stairwell. So there's a lot of, lot of problems in that that were very different in Australia. In Australia here, we do have good standards, very good standards in comparison to the rest of the world, but we do have combustible cladding too, but, but trust me, it's everywhere in the world, it's not just Australia, so we're all dealing with it at the moment. Um, recently announced as of yesterday, um, and I would have um, probably got the Minister to just comment on this, there is an uh, environmental planning assessment identification of buildings with combustible cladding regulation. This regulation comes in force the 22nd of October. Essentially what it is, there's a website address there, I won't go into detail on this, but the intent of the, of the regulation is to register your building if you think you've got a problem with it. Um, so I would encourage you to go to that website, have a look, it's, it's actually very good. I only had last night to review it, but there's a lot of really good detailed information on there. It's informative. I would be trusting websites like this and not um, hearsay from other either contractors or people out there who think they know better. You really need to direct your attention to places like this. You'll get the most informative information and you can register your building if you do have a problem. <coughs> of course, our business gets involved in this kind of thing as well, but. Um, but following this in the first instance will give you a good lead as to where you should head. Why are defects increasing in modern property? So, um, again, I'm, I'm a builder by trade, so I won't criticise builders too much or developers, but what I will say that's happened in the last 10, 15, 20 years, um, I live on the central coast, probably an hour and a half from here, and I drive down the Pacific Highway to Sydney City and back, and if anybody's driven down that Pacific Highway in the last five years and you see the units going up, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot that are going up. And what's what's alarming about that is the pace that they go up at. And in knowing construction techniques and curing times for concrete and waterproof membranes and, and all the different elements that go into a building and the times you need to do it properly, I, I'm baffled as to how that can be achieved to construct a building at that rapid pace. So that's probably some of the problems we're faced with at the moment. And I'm not labelling those buildings as defective, I'm, it's an example. Um, the, the demand in residential accommodation can drive off the planned sale. So this is what we're seeing. There's a huge demand for residential units at the moment. And off the plan sales is what's occurring. So what happens is the builders and the developers are self-managing these projects themselves. It's what, no, what we call design and construct. So the builder, in conjunction with the developer, or if he's not the developer himself, will design the project, um, as the minister pointed out, the certifier will be appointed within that uh, consortium and the designers and everybody else, the project goes ahead. There's really no traditional form of, of supervision of that project. Um, you know, we go back many years, there, there used to be what was known as a clerk of works who might supervise particularly government projects, uh, those sorts of things. That level of supervision is not there anymore. It's self-managed by the builders. This is the, this is the way the industry is. And of course, what that encourages is um, problems. Um, increased pressure on reduced construction time frames. Well, I covered on that. There, it, there is this pressure to get these buildings done. Most of these units are sold. So the pressure on the developer or the build to get this thing done is, is enormous. Um, so what that leads to is accelerated techniques to achieve a reduction in the build time. Um, skilled labourers in shortage, that's just a, a given at the moment and has been for quite some time. Unfortunately, the construction industry um, is not seen as um, attractive as, as IT and all these other professions out there. So we've got a shortage of people coming through the ranks that are learning the right skills and getting involved in these projects. Um, and, and then, of course, licensed trades require continued training on evolving industry and modern products. So the products are changing constantly. I've been doing this for 30 years and every year something changes and we've got to relearn it. And there's a, there's a distinct relation in the industry for a lot of tradies to keep up with those things. And, and what occurs is they, they might apply a, a, a five, ten year old skill to a new product to, to defects and problems. Um, 
and just cover off traditional, so what we see in a traditional kind of unit complex, and a lot of people I understand might even live in complexes like this, quite simple, duplicated layouts, a simple design. The techniques are well covered by the statutory regulations such, such as the National Construction Code and Australian Standards. So you open those books and you look for a detail uh, from the balcony to the outside or a window, you'll find all of that in the National Construction Code if there. It really helps you for buildings like that. Once we start, start talking about modern buildings like this, those standards that I referred to, they're challenged beyond their design. There's not designs in there that cater for these new modern buildings. And this is our fault. We demand modern buildings. Everybody, everybody's got an expectation that you want something nice and that looks, looks modern and it's got good value and equity and you can sell it. And so what that's done is created this problem that what we, we, we refer to as deemed to satisfy where, where if it's not in the standard there'll be a, a provision made to, to um, establish whether it actually satisfies what the intent of the code or the standard is. And certainly that's subjective. That can be bent around and changed and we, we find solutions that actually really don't satisfy at all but they've been passed through. Again, the certified being appointed through the builder and the developer, we end up with that problem. So th that's really why, if you're asking the question, why have we got so many defects? These are some of the explanations as to why we're in the situation we are today. And it is it is our fault, it's our demand. We, we demand buildings that don't look like that square box anymore. We want something that's modern, and this is unfortunately the situation we're in. Um, how to identify defects? So, I mentioned before scheduled maintenance programs, it's crucial, you must spend money to save, you have to do it, um, it's like anything else, as I mentioned before, a vehicle or, or anything else, you, you've got to spend some money to try and reduce that. Be proactive, not reactive, so many issues can be identified early. Um, I remember a situation of a, an older lady in a unit who um, was using a bucket to capture water and she'd been doing it for two or three years until it was reported and she didn't think it was a big deal. To her, it wasn't a big deal to capture that water and tip it out when it rained. And, but what that did was manifest an enormous problem that could have been dealt with many years earlier. So I think the message there is to educate occupants of the building, whether it's tenants, owner, occupiers, whoever it is there, to report all of those telltale signs. Get that out there straight away, let them know. Uh, because with, without that information, problems can escalate pretty quickly. Um, examples, um, cracking movement, mould, dampness, which is a very big one, rotting. Any, any of those telltale signs, it's crucial that they get reported straight away. Um, don't rely on uneducated or unqualified opinions. Now, I know this is probably a touchy subject with everybody here because we do have the, the, um, the committees and the people who perhaps might think they know better or, or otherwise. What I would encourage you, there's an enormous amount of experts out there. We do it, many others do it. Um, but getting the right experts involved at the right time is crucial. And if it's a waterproofing issue or if it's a plumbing issue or whatever it is, I would encourage you to pay a little bit of money, get that expert out there uh, and get the right opinion to, to stop any um, problem escalating. Um, again, we've seen uh, situations where the wrong advice has come through a committee, the problem's escalated and then all of a sudden it's, it's out of control. Okay, so step one, I'm just going to walk you through um, accountability and recovery. So the first question over is mine, you've got defects, you've got problems. Number one question, who is paying for this? Who's going to pay for this? You don't want to pay for it. So you want to, you want to walk yourself through the process. How do I get to a point where I can understand who's accountable for this? Um, so, or who we recover costs from. So the first thing is, is, is establishing how old the building is. Um, we've got what's known as the Domestic Contracts Act 1995. Holds a builder responsible for 10 years from the date of occupancy under that act for um, issues with the building. I won't go into all the descriptors, there's a lot of um, little provisions for that, but it's a general term. Uh, and there's also statutory warranties the builder must provide. Most people are probably aware of some of those. There's a, there's a two year on structural defects and a six year on non-structural defects. The definition of which is which has changed a little bit lately, much to a lot of people's dissatisfaction where um, what some people might deem a structural or a major de defect might not be defined that way, but that's how the legislation is at the moment. So working through that, if your building is over 10 years old, you have no recovery from the builder. So you're on your own and that's where you're going to have to start the process of self-funding that and working that through yourself. But if your building is under 10 years old, um, you can uh, pursue the builder or the contractor. 
Now, there's, there's a couple of provisions here. Um, a property that's up to three storeys or over three storeys, there's a homeowner's warranty insurance. Uh, it's known as the Home uh, Building Compensation Fund now, but it, it's, it's warranty on your building. That's a mandatory thing on the, on the properties that are three storeys and under, and that should be in place. To claim against that, but um, there's a few provisions or triggers. If your builder has died, disappeared, or has become insolvent, you are entitled to an insurance claim through that policy. However, if the builder is still trading, statutory obligations to repair. So you can still pursue the builder, and that, that will be through fair trading, and, and you can still enforce the, the builder to come back. He has an obligation to do that. Um, so that's your avenue for recourse there. If the building is over four storeys, as we're aware, there's no warranty cover on that. The Minister spoke about the defects bond scheme. I'll cover that later, not in great detail, but that's another provision. Um, if it's over four storeys, the builder's died, disappeared, or become insolvent, there is no recovery there. However, um, oops, sorry, if he is still um, trading, you still can pursue that. Just the fact that the homeowner's warranty is not in place doesn't stop you if the building's under 10 years old to still pursue that builder for problems or defects and what's defined as a defect. Okay, so who pays? Um, there's four scenarios I've put up the top there. Um, I won't guarantee you that's every scenario, but I'm trying to cover off as the best I can. You've got the original builder, you've got the warranty insurance, the defects bond scheme, or the owners corporation pay for it. So certainly under those first three, um, there's no financial risk to the owners corporation if you can get it over the line on one of those three. Um, but what you will be responsible for is the quality control. So certainly the builder will come back and he'll fix those things, but you, you're going to want to monitor that quality control. You can't leave it up to him to do it what he thinks is best. It's, that's going to be your responsibility there. Um, if you, as the owners corporation, do have to pay, you're going to bear the financial risk uh, and you're going to be managing the quality control and the cost control in this situation. So you've got two elements there that you've got to control. So they're the two situations and, and clearly um, you really want to try and manage that best you can. Um, the resolution, um, in my mind, is control the works to ensure satisfaction. It's crucial that you control the works when it happens, whether the builder's doing it off his own bat or whether you're paying, to make sure you're going to get what you think you really should be getting. Um, now, of course, getting experts involved is a great way to do that, but that's, um, that, that's the first half of my presentation, just covering off on those defects. How to control the works, um, I've defined sort of four key points on this, um, and I'll go through those. Um, the correct diagnosis, again, I can't uh, reinforce enough getting the right expert in. Um, I just had a conversation actually just um, during the break, and one of the things I will point out, in getting experts involved, one of the, one of the important things is having independent experts, people who don't stand to gain financially out of a, um, a determination or an outcome. So it could be, um, you know, oh, I'm trying to think of an example here, but um, if, if, a, if a scope of work is written for a particular thing, having that same person then go and do that quote on that scope and do that scope can be risky. I'm not saying every single time you're going to get caught out, but there's an element of risk involved and you have to accept that that's there. Um, and getting an independent involved who are not going to be involved, they're purely, whether it costs $5,000,000, 500000 or $5, they don't care, they'll write it as it is. So I would always encourage to get independent people involved. It is, it is a good way forward, particularly once you start talking about bigger problems. Not so much if you want the side of the building painted and you want to get your painter out for some advice. I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about bigger problems. Um, a clear defined scope of work, I can't emphasise enough how important that is. So many people get involved in projects where they stand back at the end and say, I didn't, I didn't expect that, I thought it was going to be something different. So getting that scope and, and, and your specifications and your documents in order is crucial. Um, conformity to expectations, so it's making sure you get what you, you thought you were going to get. Um, and accountability, you want to hold that person. And I'll talk about builders, but I, I, the, the word we should use is contractors because it's not always a builder, it could be a contractor you engage, as in if you only need painting work done, you're going to engage a, painting, a contractor, not necessarily a builder. Doesn't mean there's different provision, uh, provisions in terms of accountability, but um, it's just the language. So um, how is this achieved, um, which is probably a burning question. Um, so diagnosis, um, it's getting the experts engaged, uh, as I mentioned before. Inspection and testing determine the cause. Um, there's a whole uh, range of different things that can be done 
to determine cause of problems. And um, some of those things are not just coming and looking at something physically. It could be a bit of exploratory work. It could be taking a tile off, like in that instance. It could be testing. It could be balcony flooding, which is something we do where we'll block up the, the, the floor and drain and we'll fill the balcony with water and it'll help us to understand where water's coming in in certain places. It could be dye that we put in the water and we can determine. So it's, it's running through that process. Um, diagnostics is really important and it's something that um, you should invest in because it could prevent you from doing something you don't need to or it could stop something early. Um, scope of work documentation. So a detailed scope of work for anyone who's not clear on it, it's really just a list of the things that have got to be done. So it's an A to Z. Ordinarily, um, we would write it in a chronological order. So it's everything from pulling the wall sheet off through all the processes to putting it back on again in order. And it should be clear and it should be concise so you fully understand what you're getting. Um, must be comprehensive, encompass all advice from specialists and building consultants. So a good scope of work um, or a consultant will go out, they'll get the advice they need from various parties. It could be an electrical engineer or a structural engineer or other parties. They'll receive that advice, they'll convert that to plain English and put it within a scope that's all encompassing and it's all in together. It's really crucial that ha that happens because the interaction between trades and experts and, and when the job's done is, is really important. You don't want a situation where you end up um, engaging those things separately and, and a builder might do some work and, and claim he didn't understand that that was needed as well because he didn't have the information. So um, other documentation, material specifications, schedules, drawings, outlining compliance and conformity. So that's a big thing too. Whatever scope is written needs to be done in such a way it conforms with the National Construction Code and the standards. It's a pointless document if you don't. You're going to end up with more problems. Um, product selections and warranty. So it could be you as a as a owner's corporation who decide on that super expensive waterproof membrane because you're sick of all your problems and you, you know that you could go with something cheaper but you want this one because um, you just don't want any problems anymore. Um, it's important that that's documented nice and clearly um, so that you understand what that is um, that should be going down. Project planning, <coughs> excuse me, um, project planning is, is in my mind probably one of the most crucial parts. You've got your scope, you've got all your documents, you know where you're heading, but now you've got a plan for how that's all going to go. Um, a, a really important part is the predicted duration. So we're talking, we're, we're extending here into probably more major projects, so things where, where you know there's going to be quite a bit of disruption to your complex and different things are going to occur. You need to establish what that duration is um, up front. You've got to be realistic about that. You've got to look at the predicted impact to the property and occupants, including disruptions, isolations, diversions. We're talking about, you know, water shutdowns or the driveway shut down for three months or someone having to actually move out. You need to get that really, really clear. Um, part of that project planning phase, of course, if, if alternative accommodation does come into it, is the expense of that and how that's going to play out and trying to predict that. Um, Pilot works is always good too, so it's trialling a, a unit, that's an example I've used, to, to establish unforeseen items. So, so making a start and, and at least trialling just to see that that method's going to work and it's going to be successful. Staging of the works as well, so many properties, um, and this might sort of fit into your sinking fund or, or funds available, you might have to stage the works. We've got strata properties that have gone on for three or four years, um, all in accordance with the funds they've had available, um, some tremendous defects in, involved in the building where they've had no recourse, so they've had to filter that out over a number of years and get the most crucial things done back to the least crucial, but it all needs doing. Um, and cost analysis, again, it's another important one. Um, there are uh, individuals called quantity surveyors, I'm not sure whether people are familiar with them, they're not the, the road surveyors or the guys who do the survey work, they're, they're actually cost experts in the construct, they're an accountant of the construction industry, degree qualified, that's what they do, they calculate costs, we've got them in our business, there's plenty of them out there. I would encourage you to get um, the right planning advice first, and this is prior to engagement of a builder or anyone else, you're getting a really good, accurate indication of what it's going to cost you to fix this because then you can plan for that and you might not be able to afford to do it all at once. A building contract, this is the, the crux of it all. This is the absolute most critical part of anything. 
we see a lot of projects go ahead without any form of contract and it's a suicide mission, it really is. You, you cannot trust word of mouth anymore, you can't trust a handshake, it's crucial you have it in writing. I know most people would say I already know this, but uh, uh, trust me, we still come across plenty of people who don't rely upon that kind of mechanism. Um, and good faith does get taken advantage of. Um, you get talked around and there's plenty of um, convincing people out there who can do that. Um, contract terms established, so if you do have a contract, you've got to establish those terms and that's your time frames. Delay costs are a really important one. For, for, for strata properties, it's, it's really important. You get a builder involved, you get started and you get one unit owner who's really difficult and say, no, you're not getting into my unit. The builder's all of a sudden delayed and he turns around and says, well, my provision is $4,000 a day, stand down until this is fixed. And you actually weren't really aware of that. So getting that out in the open early and understanding that and disseminating that to your all of your owners so they all understand that as well is really important so that you don't get caught out by delays. They're very big expenses. Um, liquidated damages, what that is for anyone who doesn't know, is a penalty to the builder if he does not meet the time frames that are, uh, he's contractually obligated to meet. So that's something um, not all builders will agree to, but certainly if he's going to intend to charge you delay costs, you can negotiate liquidated damages on the other end to, to, to hold him accountable to say, you said you're going to take 20 weeks to do this. Um, if it takes 22 weeks, we're going to be out of pocket because we've got alternative accommodation and other things. So the penalty to you is this. And trust me, nothing drives a builder better than liquidated damages. He, he won't slow down. Um, the defects liability period. So these are periods where the builder will come back and look at um, probably more significant things. It doesn't change the statutory warranties the builder's obligated to under other provisions such as licensing and different things. Um, and then provisional sums, I've got that there. Again, for, for, for anyone who doesn't know what a provisional sum is, it's an amount of money allowed within a contract when you're not really sure what you want. It could be, um, it, it could be a provisional sum for a kitchen in each unit of $5,000 because you haven't been able to determine with every unit owner what type of kitchen they want. It's an allowance that they use each, each unit individually to spend on a kitchen and, and it's adjusted up and down accordingly whether that money's spent or not spent. Um, it's really important that when provisional sums are put into a contract by a builder or anyone else, they're realistic. They're not a ridiculous amount like $1,000 for a kitchen and you go out and start looking and you can't get anything under five and all of a sudden you're up for a lot of money. So um, it's adjusting those provisional sums so they're realistic. Um, now just, just covering off on contracts, so if we were thinking about a, a residence, like a normal house, you want to get some work done, it might be two or three hundred thousand dollars worth of work. A normal contract would look something like your owner and then you've got your principal contractor builder and a couple of other parties sitting underneath which would be subcontractors, electrician, whoever else. So it's a fairly simple contract and that can be a two-party contract. Both parties sign, you agree, move forward, not a problem. When you're talking about strata, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a different arrangement. On the, on the left hand side in the green is your owners, it's not one anymore, you've got multiple owners and you've got to get them all to agree and then on the builder side you've got a lot more subcontracts and people because there's a lot more happening. So this is where we always recommend a superintendent to the contract and if I can be clear on that uh, for anyone who doesn't know, what a superintendent is under a contract, it's like a referee in a game of football. And when two teams go out on the field, if there's no referee, like in the top example, and that game gets heated, um, you're going to end up in trouble. So a superintendent is there to administer the contract, they're written into the contract, um, and they're the referee that help the parties move forward. They hold each party accountable for all of their requirements under the contract, whether it be time bars for responses or, or payments or, or whatever those provisions are. So I'd, I'd certainly encourage you to explore that. Um, the other thing I'll just quickly cover off on too is, is the term principal contractor and in the construction world what a principal contractor is is the contractor, use the builder, but the one who takes the lead with the project, they have the accountability of workplace health safety and, and everything underneath that. So they're the ones who bear the risk. Now I'll give you an example and this example um, is a real one of a of, of, of an owner's corp going out and getting some uh, some render work done on the outside of the building. So they've paid the renderer, they've got their render work done, which is great. They, they engage the contractor directly, so there's a bit of a saving there. That was good. Work's done and finished. They go and engage their painter, they get the painter out. The painter paints the outside of the building, they pay him directly to another good saving. No builder involved, fantastic. 
all of a sudden this paint starts peeling off the wall and there's a problem. Mm. The painter turns around and says, it's not my problem, you've rendered, you've, you've, um, I didn't know how old the render was. The renderer turns around and said, we're well, supposed to leave it 28 days before you paint. Mm. There's no coordination between the two and you end up with a problem. And have a guess who, who ends up responsible for that. It's going to fall back on the owners corporation because each party are going to claim they did what the, they were contractually obligated to do. What happens with a principal contractor? You're going to pay probably 10% more on those two trades to have a principal contractor oversee that. But any of those issues are his problem, not yours. He or she, I should say. Um, it's their problem, not yours. So whether that paint peeled early or whether they put it on before they should have, you just step backwards and say, I don't care, it's not my problem, you sort it out. You're, you're taking the risk on it. That 10% you pay is the best money you'll ever invest because that's one warranty you're going to receive off one contractor. Any problem, you go back to that one contractor instead of multiple contractors where things can go wrong. And, I, and we, we see it a lot. Um, and it's good faith. People go out, they'll engage, again, a painter or somebody to, to get work done. And um, if you're not linking all of those elements together, there's problems there. Um, that's what builders are for. Um, that they know that risk. They, they know the obligations of a renderer, they know the obligations of a painter, that's what they're trained to do, so you're best leaving it in their hands to do that kind of thing. Um, the next stage is procurement. In, in simple terms, that's who's going to quote this job for me. So you're looking for the, the, the right fit contractors, builders, contractors, depending on what work. Um, so it's establishing that suitable panel. Um, certainly th there should be due diligence done in this stage. So it's uh, establishing the principle, I just covered off on that, so you, you, you're reinforcing um, this is your scope of work and by the way you're going to be the principal, this is all for you. Um, working through, uh, this is a process we would ordinarily follow, but a site familiarisation, getting them out on site and walking them through it. You do not want that excuse later on when the quote comes in for them to say, well oh, I didn't actually revisit the site, so I didn't know that this driveway was that narrow, I can't fit my truck up there. You want to get them out on site, you want to walk them through the scope of everything that needs to be done so there's no excuses. You knew you were there, you could have measured the width of that driveway and allowed for a smaller truck, that's your problem. Um, tender submissions and evaluations, so that's the next stage that usually occurs. And then establishing the true best value offer based on cost, time, inclusions and risk acceptance. Cost is not the only provision you should look at. It is crucial you look at all the elements because cost is only one element. And many times we see quotes come in, fantastic cost, but you read the fine print and boy, there's some, there's some clangers sitting in there about what the bill is going to claim if you delay him for one minute or it could be other provisions, exclusions. They might have left a whole heap of stuff out so you get started and all of a sudden you're not getting that really good membrane that you thought you were getting and you allowed for something completely different and you put in fine print at the bottom of his quote, I've allowed for a basic membrane, not a really good one that you thought you were getting. So um, a lot of it is to do with analysing that, that, um, that quote when they come in and making sure that you measure them up equally. Um, and establishing the add-ons such as variation rates and delay costs. Again, most projects do end up in, in some form of having variations and changes, latent conditions which are unforeseen things that pop up. What you want to understand with this contractor before you get into bed with them is what are you going to charge me if something goes wrong? And if those rates are horrendous and way above what industry standards are, your opportunity to adjust all of that is back at the beginning here before you sign a contract. So it's crucial you get all of that out on the table, talk it through and make sure that you don't end up in a, in a problem. Um, and then the final thing, suitability for engagement. So again, you, you really determine the capacity of this contractor to undertake it. What are their other commitments? Can they actually do this? Is it realistic for them to do it? And when can they start? because they might agree to all of these things and say I'm ready to go in six months and it's not going to suit you. So it's establishing all those things nice and early. Um, methodology two, I'm sorry, I just skipped that, but the last point on there is um, sole access to occupied. Um, what I mean by that is um, a contractor might quote on the work, everything's great, he's ready to start, and he said, oh, by the way, my provision is everyone gets out of it, every single unit so I can do all of this, and he didn't realise that. So it's really establishing what your requirements are, and they might be, we are all going to stay in occupation, but you have to work around us. So they've got to allow for that, and it's making sure that that's in place. Construction management, it starts to simplify a little bit more from here on, because you've just done a heap of work up front to make sure you're protected. And in the construction management phase, there's a, there's a bit of a triangle we use. Um, 
and it's the scope, time and cost. So you're bringing those, those three elements together and of course quality um, to make sure that you're going to get what you pay for. Um, so there's four expectations and, and this is what we understand most owners expect. When they're going to get a property uh, and building works done, they expect an all-inclusive quote. So they expect their quote has absolutely everything in it. And that means, um, you know, if an obvious variation comes up later on by a builder, you're going to be asking the question, why was that not in the scope? Wouldn't it wouldn't have been obvious that they had to do that. So this is what your expectations are. Conformance with staff's requirements, of course, your expectation is it's going to comply with whatever is current in the code and the standards. Warranty is really crucial. Your expectation is I'm going to have warranties, not just the builder's warranty, but that really good membrane you picked that has got the extended warranty for 20 years, mm -hmm. you expect that. Um, and finally, get what you pay for. Again, talking about that, uh, again, that, that membrane, having someone there to look on your behalf to make sure that you receive that, that good thing that you wanted, that was getting, that everybody decided they were all going to pay for, you need to be um, assured that you're getting what you pay for. This is a common problem we see, is that builders will quote certain things, they'll go out and the, the as installed is not as they quoted or even as in accordance with the documents that were written and it's a really crucial thing and you're going to end up with more problems. Okay, so just an overview, I've just jumped now to the strata um, building bonds and inspection scheme. So I covered that back further as, a, as a, uh, an avenue of recourse. I know most people in this room probably won't be able to leverage off this because it is a newer a newer provision. It started from the 1st of January and it's for projects from the 1st of January on and projects where contracts have been signed from the 1st of January on. I know that might contradict a little bit what the Minister stated before, but it is a case that it's only for projects that have started now. So it's for new developments only, so it doesn't, it's not retrospective, it doesn't go backwards. Uh, started the 1st of January. Um, these are for projects, anything that's not eligible for the warranty insurance private program, so that's the three storey and under. This is designed to help um, strata owners in those properties above. It's a mandatory 2% bond, so the developer deposits a bond uh, into, into an account as a managed process. There's an independent building inspector involved who comes out for a period of time. He does interim inspections. Um, there's directions issued to rectify, and that bond is released after two years. But that certainly there's a big process that happens prior to that, and that process is inspections and directions given to the builder that things aren't satisfactory. It is, it is a good program. I'm supportive of it, and I think it's certainly going to make a difference. We've not dealt with it yet, but because it's so new, even though we're three quarters of the way through the year, um, the projects that it does apply to, most of them are nearing or coming to completion, so it sort of hasn't really been effective yet in New South Wales at all. It's, it's, it's getting there, but um, there's a web address there. Again, you'll get a copy of the slide, so you can have a look at that if you need to, but um, there's a lot of information. Again, I'd encourage you to go and look there. Um, if you want to go to the horse's mouth where it comes from, this is where you should go because you're going to get all the detailed information you need. It'll support you if you do have a problem. That's just a snippet of the, um, of the website, just for your information. So that's, um, that's the end. I'm um, hoping I might have added a little bit of clarity for you just on a few topics there. Um, I've just got a, a picture there on the left of our technical service unit. So within Sedgwick we have a, a team which is our, um, our technical standards unit and we um, basically control all the different technical things in the Sedgwick business and most of these people specialise in different fields or are all more than happy to help anyone on, on any sort of problem. Uh, this is our world, this is what we deal with and, and as I said earlier, we, we very much understand the passion and the, and the um, the emotion that's involved in these things, we see it all the time. Um, we're happy to work that through. We've got you know, a number of experts in the room here who can talk to you after this, um, if need be, just on anything specific or private. But I'm happy to take any questions straight off the floor now if anyone's got anything. We've got a microphone. There was one thing up here, something. Hi, Bruce. Um, Hi. So they know each other by phone. But we've got an engineer looking at our project now, and he said 10% is not the figure charged these days. That it's a lot less. 10% as in? As in the management of the project. Are you talking builder or? In you, you um, I'm not sure if this is turned on. In your comments, like if you came onto our project, yeah. 
you would charge tax? No, no, no. So the, the comment that I made um, was a principal contractor on average would charge around about a 10% margin on top of his trades when he's preparing his quote. That's so yeah. this that, that's not a precise figure, but that's an average that we see regularly. Um, if we were doing a cost estimate on a project um, independently, we would add up all of the trades and we would add 10% to come up with a figure that would align with what builders charge. So you're saying it's not 10% of the building cost figure now? Uh, this is for a contractor I'm talking about. Yeah. It was explained to me that the, the, the cost of works yeah. The, the, the project manager would charge 10% of that cost. Oh, okay. Project management is different to what I'd refer to. Project management is actually someone coming and managing the works or managing the builder. Yeah. So that percentage can range from 3 to 7%, right, right. depending on the complexity of the project. Okay. Um, and just another, um, uh, is a superintendent the same as a project manager? Similar roles, yes. Superintendent is the... Um, uh, the contractual name for the person in the contract, but the functions they perform is very similar, yeah. And you said don't um, trust everything you read in the media. Can you yep. give me an example of that? Oh, uh, <laughs> <just, laughs> no, 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 this, this is really important. Yeah. Because this record due to, which you put on um, documents, I've been told is going to be taken off. Yeah. It's actually not going to meet code. Well, I just spoke to the minister outside and said it doesn't meet code now. Yeah. Because if, um, I thought it was in draft form. But I, if I didn't, I, I rang the, the journalist himself. He said, Even, I've seen it burn. Yeah. Now, if I didn't have that information, our building would be paid twice now in our suitable products. Look, what, what I'll say, okay, so our business, um, we don't endorse any product at all. We're not not only not a builder but we don't align with any manufacturer or anybody we are completely independent of everybody um, what i have done is witness fire tests i've been involved with suppliers um, and i know that the product you're referring to at the moment is getting used by queensland government it's getting used by a whole heap of top tier builders there's a lot of it getting used at the moment i would fail to believe that it would be the case that's non-compliant with those kinds of people involved. Well, um, Darren, Darren Hunter from Alcad said aluminium is not the way forward. Yeah. And I okay. really think that's important for owners to know. That's one person's opinion. Well, and he's I would doing be cautious. the testing because the fairly or falsifying their tests. That's, it. yeah, okay. Yes? No, I, I, well, no, I'm not going to um, endorse either product anyway. I've seen certifications through CSIRO that have endorsed the, the Fairview product. Their product's been tested like every other product correctly in accordance with AS 1530.1.3 and the 5113 test. So there's there's proper tests being done. I've seen the certificates yeah, for yeah. it. I've so, been with Darren Holly. He sends me the test results. So yeah, I'll hand over now. But I just want everyone to know that do read the media and believe what you read in the media. Lots of other questions ready to go. Michael. You've got the mic there. Yeah. Oh, hello. I'm now Bruce. I'd just like you to talk me through. Can you hold it? Oh, I'd just like you to talk me through WHS, Work Health and Safety. Uh, we have a project that's about to start very soon. Does the Owners Corporation put in the WHS report? We received a report uh, in July. Um, and the AGM rejected the report. They re decided they wouldn't receive the report. So all that WHS stuff, the whole of our 39 townhouse complex, is not going to be fixed. But we have a builder about to start. Does he put in the WHS ready for his contractors, or are we supposed to do it? I don't quite understand that. Okay, so I've got to get an understanding of what you're referring to. Um, so you're suggesting on your building there's problems um, with workplace health and safety um, many. compliance matters, is that many. what you're referring to? Many, many. Okay, and there's a builder being engaged to address those problems? Um, um, we have a builder being engaged under a, a um, what do you call it, 
you call it, compulsory strata. Right. That I've got for partial works to be repaired. Okay. And I'm just wondering, we've got asbestos. They didn't accept the asbestos reported either. Who so didn't accept that? The owners corporation at the AGM recently right. rejected the because the strata firm got a WHS report and an asbestos report, yep. but they weren't accepted. So okay, I, I couldn't comment on why they're not accepted. I have to understand why. Well, no, no one could understand that. But whose yes. responsibility is it? Is owners corporation should they be having these WHS matters fixed before the contractors come on site um, for that area, or should the, the, the builder do it himself? Well, I would expect the owners corporation, if they own the problem, are the ones who are responsible for getting it fixed. I'm, I'm presuming the builder is not involved in the project, he's just been appointed to, to fix these problems, is that correct? Or is he the original builder? He's not the original builder. They right. wouldn't have the original builder back on site, even though Fair Trading gave a rectification order. Okay. They decided they weren't going to have that and blow that. Yeah. They'd just spend another 400000 and like Yeah, look, I have to have an understanding of what the, the contractual arrangement is with the builder, whether he's contracted and ready to start. He's ready to start. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd honestly have to review the contract. I couldn't answer that without knowing. So you don't know who's can't say whose responsibility. Not without reviewing for more detail on it. No, I'd have to know. Yeah. Right, thank you very much for that. Um, lady uh, back there with the microphone. Um, hello there. Um, hi. Hi, my name's Narelle Mottow, Um and I'm on um, the Owners Corporation for our um, group. Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, and um, so just a quick question from one of our other members. We're about to do um, a major renovation and so we're in the process. We've put some things through council, etc. Um, and I guess we're all very aware about holding tradespeople accountable, etc. Yep. Um, how can we sort of guarantee the performance and the warranties? So, you know, as you mentioned, there can be bait you might pay for a quality membrane to get yep. basic. And as you probably know, that's quite a difficult one to get the certificate yep. for. Um, I think to answer that question, um, first, first and foremost, the contract. So making sure the provisions are within the contract, nice and clear that this is what the, the bill is required to do. But probably the most uh, important part mm -hmm. is inspecting, obviously, determining that that product's gone down and payment, you must not release payment prior to getting some kind of confidence that that product's gone down. Money talks, and trust me, the minute they're paid, um, your leverage is gone, and we see so many situations where people pay in good faith. They get talked into it. Look, you know, I'll get I've heard it all. It's crucial that you, you do not pay and you make sure that you have evidence of that product going down, including the certificate, if that's what you're looking for. Um, so for you, I think if there's a provision in the contract and he says, or the, the, the contractor, the builder says, I'm paid at this point when the membrane's down, you need to enforce that it's not when the membrane's down, it's when I get the certificate with the warranty. There's a big difference between the two. And would we, um, maybe we should put in the um, contract and the scope of works that, um, for instance, at these crucial points, we need to get some sort of independent Correct, person yeah. to... So there's a the term we refer to in the building industry called, well, that's a quality assurance platform that most uh, building firms use, but uh, inspection and testing, and there's a term we call hold points. And on an inspection and test plan, which is a really basic check sheet, if you like, you think about your scope of works and all the things that you want included, there's certain bits of that that are picked out as a hold point. And, and to put it simply, there's a big H put next to them on a sheet. And the builder works through that, and it's mandatory. He stops at that point, hold, and he must notify the expert, the owner, whatever you stipulate, however you want that to go, um, and it's signed off, witnessed at that point, then you can move to the next point. Um, and there needs to be stringent conditions in place if he fails to do that. Worst case is he has to pull it apart again and go back to where he should have held. Um, and you can have that written in contractually, that's a very common thing. Um, but picking out the whole points is crucial. Things like a membrane, if you're putting a membrane on a balcony, the best time to inspect that is when it goes down, not when the tiles are over it. And you put a bucket of water on and you realise that it leaks. So you'd be putting a whole point when, the, or, or even going back a step, preparing the substrate before the membrane goes down. That's another common one. Whole point there, an expert or somebody can come in, look, 
and give the thumbs up and say that surface is ready for the membrane and I'm confident it's going to stick to that now because you've properly prepared as opposed to being covered in dust and you know, um, they're just examples. Yeah, okay, so you probably just need someone also to just look at that scope of work. Oh look, I, again, I'm, um, yeah. having an expert involved is crucial and, <laughs> and look, when, when I say that and I, I know women raised a, a topic about project management and percentages and things, um, bigger projects might warrant a project manager involved at a heavy degree, smaller projects might might not need that, but you, it doesn't stop you from engaging on a piecemeal basis, experts, just to come in and look at certain things if that's what your concern is. Um, don't ever feel obligated that you have to take the whole package on all the time because it's, it, sometimes it's not warranted uh, for a smaller project, but it doesn't mean you can't use it. Cool, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. Um, gentlemen with glasses. Are there any others with glasses? Um, <laughs> Back to probably the first slide, which uh, uh, one of the first slides. Anyway, if you uh, have a committee, Australian committee, that's not particularly familiar with going out to tender for a job and, and uh, possibly a building manager who's not uh, commonly <laughs> filled those, but not commonly goes through those processes, where can you where can you get help to for that sort of right at the beginning of? of a significant project to uh, Yeah, look, um, it's what our business does, so that's part of what we do. We're one of many, oh, not won't say many, but we're, there are competitors who do it as well, but it's certainly what we do. And again, back to the last point I made, um, your project might not be big and significant. You might not even have the funds to pay for, you know, a, a percentage of a project management of the whole thing. But certainly getting assistance up front and even getting that tender process run where you might elect to say let an expert run that process, get the right outcome, analyse the quotes, pick it apart, negotiate with the builder, reject the quote, make them go back and rewrite it if it's not inclusive and provide a recommendation to you that you're comfortable with. Um, and then it might be you say we can take it from here. Um, that, yeah, there's, there's nothing stopping that occurring. Certainly we can provide assistance all the way through to the end and manage and inspect and sign off and all of those things. Um, but if, if I was recommending, you know, if it was a budgetary thing that came in, getting that um, early um, diagnostics right, uh, the planning right so that it's nice and clear and that procurement stage right is really crucial. Everything goes pear-shaped after that if it's not set up right. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, <laughs> Just a simple question. I'm living with the same as the Linda, and we are going to put up a new cladding, and I want to make sure it's safe. So, is pure aluminium, solid aluminium, is safe enough to put up the cladding? Okay. Um, the I won't get too much into the technical detail, but what I will say, um, there's a whole range of products on the market, and what everybody's going to understand, combustible materials, materials on buildings have been used for, forever. Um, we think about products like cedar cladding, for argument's sake, it's been used forever. So, um, high-rise buildings is where the concern is, so it's buildings where, um, to put it quite simply, where fire appliances and things can't get access to, um, that's the higher risk. So it's type A and even type B construction is, is where it comes in. Um, aluminium cladding, it's, aluminium doesn't propagate in itself, it, it can't. It's a, it's a metal material. It, it melts and it fails, I'll, I'll give it that. It's got a low melt point of six or 700 degrees, so it will melt. I have seen this in full scale tests. So, um, but the material you put on the outside of your building, the important part is it doesn't propagate or spread fire or contribute to the spread of fire. So what you put on the outside of your building doesn't need to be fire rated, as in um, a, a shield to prevent fire. It's just not got to be flammable. That's that's the.